Hello everyone, my name is Ki, and welcome to this episode of Metamorphoses. Last time we ended up with Jupiter, the king of the gods, deciding all humans must be destroyed, because one of them, Lycaon, was a terrible being, and also the rest were kind of violent too. This time, the gods will actually destroy everyone. Almost. This is Book 1, Episode 4, Out with the Old and In with the New, Cubans. Jupiter ends his story, and that's why every human needs to die. Seems a bit harsh, but apparently not to the gods. They applaud Jupiter and he gets a standing ovation, probably. Then, for some reason, there's a line about the gods being regretful they are going to end the human race. There's a simpler answer to that, guys. Don't. Anyway, they're like, who's going to live on the earth? And more importantly, who's going to sacrifice to us? And Jupiter is like, Chill, I'll take everything into account and create a solution to your problems. What's his solution? New humans, of course. Out with the old and in with the new. So then the question is, how do you destroy every human? Jupiter, being Jupiter, thinks it could be a great idea to kill everyone with lightning. Now, I'm no scientist, but I think lightning strikes can kill only one person at a time, if they kill the person at all. Some people survive being struck by lightning. Jupiter is going to go around the whole world and strike every single person with lightning. Now, Jupiter doesn't actually go through with his first idea, not because it's really tedious and frankly impossible, no, it's because he doesn't want to accidentally set everything on fire. Because the flames might get so high, they will reach the gods, and they want to exterminate the pesky humans, but not at the cost of their own palaces. So, on to plan B it is. A flood. Yes, the Roman version of Noah's Ark is what we'll talk about next. Actually, interesting fact, a lot of cultures have a story about a great flood of some sort. Scholars are trying to find out if these recurring stories can be linked to a real tsunami somewhere in the distant past. So, how do you make a flood? Jupiter goes to Aeolus, the god of the winds. He locks up all the winds who could blow away rain clouds and lets out the southern storm wind. And he gets to work. He makes it rain. A lot. There's a description of what the southern storm wind looks like. It's basically a wet dude, and that's not a great way to describe anyone. His beard's wet, his forehead's wet, his hair's wet, his torso's wet, and his wings too. Which, yeah, he has wings, and they're wet. Not great for flying, I think, but what do I know? Then Iris, the goddess of rainbows. What a title. She sucks up water somehow, and takes it to the clouds so they can make more rain. That's confusing. So by now the humans are sad, because all their crops are destroyed, because of all the rain. This is not enough for Jupiter. He asks for help from his brother, Neptune. He calls the water streams, who are also conscious beings somehow. Honestly, everything in Roman religion has some god attached to it, so I shouldn't be surprised. Neptune tells these water streams to just go for it. And they do. For good measure, Neptune, who is also the god of earthquakes, makes the earth shake on top of all this, so everything gets destroyed. This seems like overkill. Killing all humans, yes, okay, but everything else is also swept up in this flood. The trees and plants, the animals. Eventually everything is just sea. There's no more dry land. People adapt, in a way. They try to go to the top of hills. They ride atop the water in boats. Some catch fish. Then comes what's probably my favourite part of the story this week. Ovid describes what this looks like. The whole world underwater. It's a description I think sounds very beautiful, but lonely, melancholic. You can almost hear the sound of being underwater. There's a beautiful dissonance between a place that's obviously dead and deserted, but there's still life, even if it's not the sort of life that's supposed to be there. And so, I would like to read a few lines directly to you, from David Rayburn's translation. Look at a man on that hill or sitting alone in his fishing boat, rowing across the fields where he recently guided his plowshare. Another is sailing above his cornfields, or over the roof of his vanished farmhouse, or casting his line in the top of an elm tree. He might have dropped anchor to catch in the soil of a grassy meadow, or else this dinghy is scraping the vineyard trellis below him, 
There in the field, where the slender goats were lately browsing on tufts of grass, the seals are resting their clumsy bodies. On the water, the narrates gaze in utter amazement at coppices, cities and buildings. The woods are invaded by dolphins. Ah, chills. Everything that are not gods or fish dies. There's a sad image of a bird flying until it's exhausted, and then falling into the never-ending ocean and dying. Even the humans in the boats, who can catch fish, eventually perish from hunger, I suppose because fish alone is not a very good diet. Two people survive this, Drakalian and Pira. They are floating on the water in their boat, for some reason they specifically haven't died yet, even though other people in boats have. They pray to the gods for help. And apparently, these two are just great humans, because Jupiter decides to let them live. Even more, he decides to stop the rain. Neptune and Triton, who is Neptune's son, make the water go back to the seas and oceans where it belongs. Triton blows on his sea conch, which sounds worse than it is, and the water deities everywhere return to their homes. And so the land under the water returns to the surface, though there's still seaweed hanging in the trees. So the world is back, but it's still kind of empty. Jukalian talks to Pira. He, interestingly, calls for his sister and wife in the same line. And me, thinking, well, you never know what these myths, had to look it up. They're not brother and sister. They are cousins, though. Jukalian is a son of Prometheus, you remember, the titan who made the first humans out of clay and gave them fire. No idea when he was able to have children being chained to a rock, although I guess that's bondage and some people are into that. Pira is a daughter of Epimetus, Prometheus' brother. Deucalion had understandably developed a fear of clouds. That's true, my baby. This has nothing to do with the rest of the story, but it's interesting information, and that's why I'm here. Anyway, he tells his cousin-slash-wife about how lonely they are now, and that if he were alone without her, he'd die too. Very romantic. Deucalion wishes he could make humans out of clay, like Prometheus. Then they cry. I suppose you deserve to cry after you've lost everything and everyone, and the gods you worship were the ones to do it, and you're expected to still worship them. It's obviously not framed like that in the actual text, but I don't like Jupiter's decision here, so I don't care. Jukalian and Pira decide to ask what to do next at the Oracle. They sprinkle some water on their head and clothes for purification, and head to the Temple of Themis. Now, the river where they get the water for the purification rite is called Giphysus which, as it happens, is quite close to Delphi. It is not literally mentioned, but Jukalian and Pira probably go to the Oracle of Delphi, where at this moment, Themis was still in charge. Later, and we'll see this next episode, Apollo becomes in charge of this Oracle. Themis is a titan. She's connected to order and law, and to the oldest oracles. So, at Themis' temple, the two survivors kneel down and ask Themis how they can restore humanity. Themis answers, and as all oracles, the answer is somewhat weird. She says, You need to cover your head, loosen the buttons on your cloaks, and throw the bones of your big mother on your tracks. If you are confused by this answer, well then, welcome to the Oracle of Delphi. Jukalian and Pyrrha are also confused. Pyrrha in particular pleads with Themis to tell them something else, to give them another option. She doesn't want to go dig up her mother's bones and throw them around. Themis doesn't answer, and the two keep thinking on the words of the Oracle. Until finally, Jukalian thinks he has an idea. He comments that oracles are sacred, and that they are never out to do evil, which is an interesting comment, considering the amount of times oracles totally wreck everyone's lives and myths. Jukalian guesses the big mother is the earth, and the bones are stones, as stones are like the bones of the earth. Pira agrees that maybe this is the answer, and they set out to do just that. They put veils on their heads, loosen their clothes, and throw stones behind them. Then, because this interpretation was right, the stones slowly became soft and took the form of humans. And all the stones Jukalian had thrown became men, and the stones Pira had thrown became women. And because they once were stones, humans are hardened to certain circumstances, and they can endure a lot. So. That was it for this week's episode. If you want to contact me, my email is metamorphoses.key at gmail.com. Also, come hang out with me on Twitter. That's at metamorphoseskey. Gay. Next time, one of the most famous stories in the Metamorphoses will be told, 
the story of Apollo and Daphne. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, bye.